Good morning, everyone. Uh, Committee on Health and Human Services will come to order. It is Wednesday, February 8th, and uh, we have two bills on the agenda today, so we are going to get going. Um, and there is a quorum present. So first up on our agenda today is Senate File 23. Um, Senator Dibble, did you have an amendment? Yes, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I have the A1 amendment. Okay. Um, Okay, there's in your packet and Senator Bolden, would you move the A1? Yes, Madam Chair, I would move the A1 amendment. Okay, any discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. Motion prevails. Senator Dibble to your bill as amended. Um, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, as well as to uh, Madam Chair who's watching via Zoom, I believe. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to present Senate File 23. Let me also take the opportunity to thank my co-authors, uh, Senator Mann, Senator McQuaid, Senator Umu Verbaten, and Senator Gustafson. Madam Chair and members, Senate File 23, put most simply, would ban the practice of coercing young people into conversion therapy by licensed practitioners. However, I have to say that therapy is a generous term in this context. Conversion therapy, is a treatment, a practice that is not only ineffective, it is harmful. It has long been discredited and denounced by responsible and credible practitioners of medical and mental health care. Here's what the American Academy of Pediatrics has to say. Therapy directed specific, at specifically changing sexual orientation is contraindicated since it can provoke guilt and anxiety while having little or no potential for achieving changes in orientation. The American Psychiatric Association says the potential risks of what used to be called reparative therapy, and I'll come back to that point in a moment, Madam Chair, are great, including depression, anxiety, and self-destructive behavior, since therapist alignment with societal prejudices against homosexuality may reinforce self-hatred already experienced by the patient. Many patients who have undergone reparative therapy relate that they were inaccurately told that homosexuals are lonely, unhappy individuals who never achieve acceptance or satisfaction. The possibility that the person might achieve happiness in satisfying interpersonal relationships as a gay man or lesbian is not presented, nor are alternative approaches to dealing with the effects of societal stigmatization discussed. Therefore, the American Psychiatric Association opposes any psychiatric treatment, such as reparative or conversion therapy, which is based upon the assumption that homosexuality per se is a mental disorder or based upon the a priori assumption that a patient should change his or her sexual homosexual orientation. And finally, with your indulgence, Madam Chair, the American Psychological Association concludes that there is insufficient evidence to support the use of psychological interventions to change sexual orientation. And they say more, but I will um, dispense because we're going to hear from some professionals shortly. Conversion therapy includes an array of practices that seeks to persuade or induce an individual into believing their sexual orientation or gender identity or expression has been changed. That is shown to be impossible. The true effect is to communicate to that person that they are disordered, who they are is wrong and sinful. This causes damage in the form of depression, decreased self-esteem, substance abuse, self-harm, and suicide. This industry preys on people's fears and does irreparable harm to young people. The bill also seeks to prevent parents from being misled and deceived by the agents of the conversion therapy industry. To be clear, this bill does not reach into religious practice or belief or any practice or form of prayer in that realm. The restrictions apply to paid professional services. 20 states, Washington, D.C., Puerto Rico, and 75 cities, including a number of them here in Minnesota, have taken this step to protect their young people. In July of 2021, Governor Walz signed an executive order in an attempt to curtail the practice. But as we know, executive orders are limited in reach and they expire. Madam Chair, members, the time is long past when we should be affirming to all people, including LGBTQ people, that they are perfect as they are. Welcome to show up wherever they are wanted, wherever they are needed, as good, fully human, bringing the entirety of their talents to every endeavor. We would all be richer for that. So with that, Madam Chair, um, I'm happy to respond to questions or proceed to testimony, whatever is your wish. 
Thank you, Senator. So I think what we'll do is go to uh, testifiers at this time. We do have a long list of testifiers, so we are going to limit everyone to two minutes and 30 seconds so we can hear from everyone. Um, you'll hear a timer and then we'll ask you to wrap up your thoughts if you haven't finished by then. Our first testifier will be on Zoom, but I'll call up the next three that are here in person. We have Kat Roan, Christy Grom, and I'm sorry if I completely ruin your names, um, and Jay Aaron White, if you can come up to the table, and then we'll go to Seal Dwyer on Zoom for the first testimony. Nobody here? Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Thank you so much for allowing me to appear here today and for allowing me to appear on Zoom. My name is Seal Dwyer. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist. I'm in private practice in St. Cloud, and I'm a queer person. I work primarily with the LGBTQ population in Minnesota, and more specifically with LGBTQ people with trauma. Every single day I work with folks who struggle with mental health concerns. The rate of mental health concerns in the LGBTQ community is high. 73% of LGBTQ youth support, report anxiety symptoms and 58% report depression symptoms. 82% of LGBTQ youth wanted mental health care and 45% of LGBTQ youth have considered suicide. 14% have attempted suicide within the last year. These are numbers according to the Trevor Project. Conversion therapy is trauma. Conversion therapy harms people. When something is touted as therapy, therapy means to heal, not to harm. The numbers that I just cited more than double in the LGBTQ population when exposed to conversion therapy. 28% of LGBTQ youth exposed to conversion therapy attempted suicide in the last year. Nearly one third of all LGBTQ youth who were exposed attempted suicide. Conversion therapy is commonly used as a threat with LGBTQ youth with similar results. 27% of LGBTQ youth who have attempted suicide with, when threatened with conversion therapy. We know that the number one thing that people can do to lower the suicide rate among, amongst queer folks is to be accepting. Affirming homes and schools cuts the suicide rate in half. I have served clients that have been treated, treated with conversion therapy. The shame, the trauma, the harm that they express is ongoing for years. For a practice that is called something that is meant to heal and it causes such long lasting and extended harm, it must be stopped. Please. Please ban conversion therapy in Minnesota. Please make us a state where we stand up and we say, LGBTQ youth are welcome here. LGBTQ people are welcome here in all of their great diversity. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Dwyer. Uh, next up, we have Kat Rohn. Thank you, good morning. Thank you, Senator Dibble. Chair, committee members, my name is Kat Roan, and I serve as executive director for Outfront Minnesota, our state's largest LGBTQ plus advocacy organization. I come to testify in support of SF23 that seeks to ban conversion therapy for minors and vulnerable adults. This year, Minnesota has the opportunity to build on the momentum of communities across our state who have already enacted municipal bans and to join with states across the country who have taken this step to end the harmful and discredited practice of so-called conversion therapy. This practice is thoroughly rejected by every major medical and professional organization in the field. It is demonstrated to increase anxiety, depression, and suicidality for those who endure it, and it has no standards of care, no proof of efficacy, no legitimacy as a practice. This is not therapy at all. It is a harmful practice whose very premise stands in contrast to the LGBTQ plus Minnesotans leading vibrant, joyous, thriving lives here in our state. Unfortunately, it is still practiced today. 
Over the course of three House hearings, I have heard from survivors of this practice and individuals close to them. I thank them for coming forward and for sharing what are often deeply painful and personal experiences. And I ask you to think about those who are not with us today as a result of the harms caused by this practice. LGBTQ plus individuals deserve to be affirmed and supported for who we are. And we should have the confidence that when we seek support from mental health professionals, that we will receive appropriate evidence-based care that is effective. Minnesota is ready to protect children and vulnerable adults from the harmful and discredited practices of so-called conversion therapy, and I urge you to support this bill. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next up, we have Christy Grom. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, for the record, Christy Grom with the Department of Human Services. Um, first of all, I want to thank Senator Dibble for bringing forward this important piece of legislation, and thank you, uh, Madam Chairs, for making some time in committee to talk about how um, impactful this, this will be when it passes. So the governor, the lieutenant governor, the Department of Human Services all support Senate File 23, which codifies Governor Walz's executive order that would ban um, the, um, the use of conversion therapy across all of our Minnesota health care programs as well as other payer types. Um, as we've heard today, conversion therapy is not really therapy at all. It's a misled, cruel practice that's really sadly based in fear and shame. Um, there is no efficacy, as has been noted. Um, and in fact, it's not only um, not effective, but it's actually harmful to people. Children and youth are among those of us who, um, who depend on us as adults, as lawmakers, as public servants, to really ensure access to a health care system that first and foremost um, aims to uh, and is founded on the principles of doing good, not doing harm. Um, I'll kind of go over the, the comments I wanted to make around the data because I think that's been shared today and probably can be um, explicated by, by clinicians better than I, but I'll just say um, at the Department of Human Services, our aim is to help people meet their basic needs, to help them get access to the health care that they need so that they can live in dignity and that they can reach their highest p potential. And um, there is nothing dignified or frankly civilized about subjecting people to and charging them for pseudoscience disguised as healthcare. There is nothing dignified or morally right about telling someone that the price to pay to be deserving of love and acceptance is that they have to completely change who they are. And there is nothing um, dignified or factual about treating someone's sexual orientation or gender identity as disordered. It is not. Um, people are perfect and whole and beautiful just the way they are. We need to celebrate that diversity, not whitewash it. Um, so it is, it is our belief at the administration that we should take a stand on gender justice, on health justice. Um, it's our belief that every child, every youth in Minnesota should um, be able to grow up in, in the best place um, for them, um, whether they're black, brown, LGBTQ, or whatever other identities they might describe to. Um, and so for all of these reasons, Madam Chair, members, um, and really um, on behalf of our fellow neighbors who have come forward today um, and in the past to share their stories, I want to um, let them know that we stand with you and that we urge members to support Senate File 13 in putting an end to this tragic process and, and um, practice. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Grom. Um, I'll call up uh, J. Aaron White and Hunter Cantrell to the table next. And Mr. White, you can go ahead and introduce yourself and begin your testimony. Well, thank you. Madam Chair, my name is J. Aaron White. I'm a Twin Cities pastor, husband, and father. I speak today as a Christian minister who has sincerely held religious beliefs like many other Minnesotans. And I believe it is important to obey those convictions. This is my worldview, one that informs my life both in the pulpit as well as in counseling sessions and conversations. The conversion therapy ban you are proposing not only muzzles Christian counselors from acting in accordance with their consciences, but it also robs the client who desires biblical counseling of the opportunity to receive it. Moreover, as a pastor, this bill has a chilling effect on my ministry as I operate in all my interactions from a biblical theological vantage point. This bill will be contested because it is simply too broad. In short, it violates my right to the free exercise of religion. 
and it seeks to coerce my speech in a manner that violates my conscience, my deeply held beliefs that forbid me to encourage children or adults toward sterilization. Moreover, associating the counsel of the vast majority of Christian counselors and pastors with the use of harmful practices is inaccurate. Harmful methods such as shock therapy and induced vomiting, though reprehensible, are red herrings that only serve to create a straw man. No one disagrees that harmful practices are unwarranted. It is the concern over regulating speech that has many of us deeply concerned. Biblical counselors and pastors must act in accordance with their consciences. For me, it is the freedom to provide resources and counsel that encourage health and healing, the thankfulness that the body our Creator gave us. Those who wish to receive biblical counseling, youth or adult, should have the freedom and ability to obtain it. Again, this bill is dangerously broad and, more importantly, poses an illegal threat to the free exercise of religion and free speech. Like many pastors, my conscience is held captive to the Lord Jesus Christ and the authority of his word, not a law of compelled speech. With that, I do thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. White. Um, We'll call up Dr. David Kirby and Tanner Mobley to the table. And Dr. David Kirby, uh, introduce yourself. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair and and members. My name is David Kirby, Doctor of Psychology for almost 30 years now in Minnesota, treating gay, trans, and binary clients. As a psychologist, I never approach the sacred counseling relationship with an agenda of changing or converting anyone. I am there to serve my clients, whoever they are. They lead me where they want to go. In fact, I specifically tell my clients at the beginning of their journey that I am not here to change you, but to listen to you, care for you, and respect your goals. So I am absolutely opposed to any therapy that coerces any client. I am also opposed to this bill and saddened by it for several reasons. First, conversion therapy is described by supporters of this bill to include shock therapy, aversive vomiting, rape, and other coercive techniques. How often would you expect a licensed professional to engage in these crude practices? And yet this bill is aimed at licensed professionals. If testifiers for this bill claim to know dozens of these practitioners, ask them to produce names and license numbers. Will you do that in the name of due diligence? This bill is misleading. Second, as I just mentioned, the target of this bill is licensed professionals who are already stringently governed by their board of ethics. For example, APA Standard 3.04 clearly states that a psychologist shall do no harm to clients, including torture. Why do we need more governing? This bill is unnecessary. Third, this bill does not ban conversion therapy only, but slides in other therapies to outlaw as well. What therapies are banned alongside conversion therapy? Any treatment that does not affirm gay identity, including talk therapy. Does anyone have a problem with this, dictating counseling goals and eradicating clients' freedom of choice? This bill is about blatant discrimination in violation of First Amendment rights. Fourth, the goal of this bill is not really about banning conversion therapy, but about banning something else, a minor's right to choose what type of therapy they want. Even if minor clients have been sexually abused, they can only receive counseling that is gay-affirming. This bill crusades against the abuses of coercive therapy, but then turns around and coerces minors into one treatment option dictated by the government. If you could wrap up your thoughts, please. Yes, uh, one last sentence. How can a person in the same breath condemn a wrong, but then turn around and repeat the wrong? Thank you very much. Thank you, Doctor. Next up, I'd like to call Renee Carlson and Matthew Shurka. You are... Tanner Mobley. Okay. Then you go ahead, introduce yourself, and proceed. Good morning. Uh, My name is Tanner Mobley, and I'm here today testifying on behalf of the Trevor Project, uh, the leading suicide prevention organization for LGBT youth. 
To further our mission of ending LGBT youth suicide, uh, we're dedicated to ending practices commonly referred to as conversion therapy. We stand with every reputable medical and mental health organization in condemning these practices as uneth excuse me, unethical, harmful, and found in unscientific theories that have been debunked for decades. Um, at the Trevor Project, uh, we have direct experience and extensive research observing the dangers of these practices. In our 2022 national survey, which reflects the experiences of nearly 34,000 LGBT youth in the US, we found that 6% reported going through conversion therapy and an additional 11% have been threatened with it. These youth who were either threatened or exposed to conversion therapy were more than twice as likely to have a suicide attempt in the past year. Our counselors don't explicitly ask about conversion therapy when youth call us in crisis. But in the last year, 1,300 contacts in more than 600 cities in the U.S. explicitly brought the issue up themselves. Um, and finally, these practices also have drastic financial impacts on families in our country. In, a, uh, in 2022, a peer-reviewed journal of the American Medical Association used health economics to estimate the direct costs of conversion therapy to be more than $650 million dollars. Uh, furthermore, the indirect costs with associating depression, suicide attempts, et cetera, that come with these practices is estimated to be uh, $8 billion. Uh, thank you so much for taking up for this, uh, this important issue. Uh, we urge you to act in protecting young people from these dangerous practices. Thank you, Mr. Mobley. Uh, Ms. Renee Carlson. Madam Chair and members, <clears throat> my name is Renee Carlson. I serve as general counsel for True North Legal. Life isn't easy. We know this from the testimonies heard today. Because every person's story is different, access to trusted counselors is critical. Moreover, counselors and clients should direct the conversation about a client's counseling experience, not the government. But Senate File 23 doesn't allow either. It stifles personal counseling goals by censoring constitutionally protected speech of licensed counselors, clients, and many others, which is likely to result in a vacuum of care, leaving patients who voluntarily seek counseling without any options. Senate File 23's unconstitutional discrimination based on content and viewpoint permits speech that helps a person change his or her gender identity or embrace same-sex attractions, yet bans speech that helps a person address unwanted same-sex attractions or gender identity confusion. The U.S. Supreme Court has long protected the First Amendment rights of professionals, such as therapists and counselors, and signaled that counseling censorship laws, such as Senate File 23, violate these rights. And just a few years ago, the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals struck down a Florida law with similar yet even narrower language than Senate File 23, holding it was an infringement on constitutionally protected speech under the First Amendment, stating the First Amendment does not allow communities to determine how their neighbors may be counseled about matters of sexual orientation or gender. Senate File 23's consumer fraud provision makes the bill the most expansive counseling bill in the country. The bill's vague and overly broad language leaves counselors, clients, and others expected to comply with prohibitions confused about what the prohibitions actually are. However, under the proposed bill, faith-based organizations engaging in faith-driven activities could be subjected to severe legal consequences and ruinous lawsuits. Minnesotans of diverse faith backgrounds will be caught between liability under the law and strong moral convictions. There is no justification for legislation that violates Minnesotans' freedom of speech in a very private setting while imposing severe legal consequences for Minnesotans who simply want to live consistent with their deeply held religious beliefs. I ask you to review my testimony, my written testimony submitted, and I thank you for this time, members. Thank you, Ms. Carlson. I'll call up Matthew Shurka and Joseph Prenosil. And um, Mr. Shurka, you can proceed. Mm -hmm. 
Good morning, members of the Senate Committee on Health and Human Services. My name is Matthew Shurka. I'm representing the National Center for Lesbian Rights, a legal, a legal organization working to protect the civil and human rights of LGBTQ people. I'm also the co-founder of our Born Perfect campaign, a national campaign representing survivors of conversion therapy across the country, including myself, a survivor of conversion therapy. Thank you for the opportunity to express my support uh, for Minnesota, so <clears throat> my support for Minnesota Senate File 23, protecting minors from the dangerous practice of conversion therapy. Our team has worked to protect LGBTQ youth by supporting legislation such as today's bill, File 23, uh, specifically protecting youth from conversion therapy. Thus far, 20 states and over 120 municipalities have passed such legislation, each of those laws are receiving bipartisan support. Here in Minnesota, the state if with this passage, we'll be codifying and codifying an already understood issue with extraordinary amounts of evidence that any attempts of conversion therapy is harmful, fraudulent, and may cause lifelong damage and potential suicide. Personally, I am one of 700,000 people living in the United States today that have experienced so-called conversion therapy, as that number is reported by the UCLA Williams Institute. Born Perfect hears from survivors every day who experience conversion therapy. Our data is built off of first-hand experience and accounts tracking therapists in each state. Our data shows that here in Minnesota that there are 109 active conversion therapists. 40 of those individuals are licensed practitioners by the state, and in addition, 40 organizations within the state have been reported to either recommending and or participating in conversion therapy through a referral program with licensed practitioners. My personal experience with conversion therapy aligns with the many harms reported by National Mental Health Medical Associations. I was in conversion therapy for five years from ages 16 to 21. Each of my therapists was a licensed professional. In meeting with a licensed therapist, my father was told that being gay was, not, was a mental illness, that same-sex attraction can be cured, and that all people are innately heterosexual. My first treatment required that I did not speak to my mother and two sisters, which lasted three years. I was told this would ensure I would not pick up any effeminate behaviors or see girls or women as my peers, but to learn that men are my peers. While I truly believed conversion therapy was working, I became depressed and suicidal in year two of that time in therapy. May I finish this? It's not much longer. Or I, I can end. If you could just wrap up your thoughts, please. Sure. I just wanted to add that I was also subjected to the use of Viagra engaging in sexual activity when I didn't have erectile dysfunction as a, as a healthy young 17 year old man. To speak to the cost, my parents spent $30,000 in the five years of my conversion therapy. I'm gonna hand out these uh, testimonies and reports. One of them specifically is 25 former therapists who no longer do conversion therapy are in support of the passage of file 23. Um, and it's a really powerful document to have former conversion therapists oppose doing conversion therapy and supporting such legislation and survivors. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shirka. Mr. Prenisil. Uh, chairman and councilman. Um, I am an adoptive father of 10 special needs children. Um, five with cerebral palsy and other birth defects that have now passed away. Four with FASD, 16, they were ages 16 to 40. Two of them are still at home. Mr. Prentissil, if you could speak a little closer to the microphone, we're having a hard time hearing you. Okay, and another with FASD diagnosed at seven and reactive attachment disorder diagnosed at 14. He is presently in a crisis home in Anoka County. He identifies himself as transgender. When he was born, his mother was on drugs at birth. My wife and I, as grandparents of his adopted father, cared for him after birth. After a month, Ramsey County decided to have him return to his parents. He was hired by, we hired a lawyer and were unsuccessful in his removal from his home. He was neglected for five years. As a footnote, uh, my daughter was able to adopt his brother one year earlier from Anoka County. Four years later, Hanlon County asked us to adopt him as well as his half-brother and half-sister. In grade school, he exhibited uncomfortableness with his gender. At the beginning of the middle school, his anger, even with substantial drugs for anxiety, required out-of-home placement. He has been in two group homes, 
prairie care for almost two years, a line of physical psych ward for several months, and out of state mental hospital for nine months. He returned home about two years because of his anger and attempted suicide. He was placed in a crisis facility. In this crisis facility, he dresses as a female. As far as proposed legislation, I believe it's overreach because it would deny him the counseling for his reactive attachment disorder because he's transgender. But again, reactive attachment disorder dominates his behavior. Research has shown that identity issues come from neglect, as cited in this book. I've got some was sexual identity by John Finley, and it's been really helpful for me to figure out what's going on with him. Also, I believe there is a there is a void created for this type of treatment. I believe the school boards will fill this void with their own solutions. And as of late, I can only imagine what that would be. Transgender legislation cannot be allowed to eliminate other treatments. I believe my experience supports that by North Legal, Minnesota Catholic Conference, and Minnesota Family Conference. What does work? I believe the pros therapies treat the symptoms I also believe my gen, many transgender disorders that are existing therapies. Mr. Pernicell, I'm sorry to interrupt, but if you could wrap up your thoughts, okay. please. Just a couple more are not long lasting. I also believe there are alternatives which are not eliminate the cause, provide long lasting support. Those like AA, L Anon, and Emotions Anonymous, and provide an alternative support that rely on a higher power. Thank you, sir. Next up, we'll call Dr. Pastor Nate, uh, Pastor Nate Oilo and Dr. Marge Charmoli to the table, please. Please introduce yourself and begin your testimony. Good morning, Madam Chair and members. My name is Nate Oilo, and I oppose this bill. Uh, as an adolescent, I experienced same-sex attractions. Knowing that homosexual practice was inconsistent with my deeply held religious faith, I chose to explore my options with the help of qualified mental health professionals and pastoral caregivers. I was not forced. I was not coerced. I wasn't abused. Um, I was honored and loved in that I was given the power of choice and the dignity to think for myself. In addition to professional and pastoral help, I also benefited from many books, curricula, and conferences that supported my desire to bring my same-sex attractions into agreement with my religious faith. 25 years later, I still look back fondly on all the resources that were available to me, all of which set me up to live the life that I wanted. I have very good memories of my conversion experience. Like many of the others have testified, no one on either side of this issue supports physical or sexual abuse, extreme shaming, or coercion as a means to help people with same-sex attractions, but that was not my experience. These practices are wrong, and they're already outlawed. If a pastor or therapist is physically or sexually abusing someone, we have laws to protect the victim. Clearly, what is being discussed here is talk therapy. Is Minnesota really going to outlaw talk therapy? There are many in this state, like me, who have found freedom from unwanted same-sex attractions and who are now enjoying marriage and family or celibacy. Um, I've been married for over 18 years and the father of three wonderful children. I stand with and for each one of them. We want our stories to be heard. We are from Minnesota, too. We want to write books to sell, and we want to be compensated for sharing our stories at events. We desire the same freedoms and protections afforded everyone else in this state. I stand with and for every Christian, Jew, Muslim faith leader who believes in a traditional view of marriage, family, sex, and sexuality. We promote transformation because our religious books promote transformation. Um, there are many in this state who desire 
the input of their faith communities so as to make well-informed, wise choices regarding how to navigate their same-sex attractions or gender dysphoria in a way that honors their religious faith. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Doctor, you can introduce yourself and proceed. Uh, hello, Vice Chairman and uh, Chairperson Wickland by via Zoom. And thank you, Senator Dibble. Uh, my name is Dr. Margaret Charmley. I'm a licensed psychologist who is here to testify on behalf of the Minnesota Psychological Association in conjunction with the American Psychological Association. We support Senate File 23 to ban conversion therapy. Psychologists are primary arbiters of what constitutes psychological disorders as well as effective therapy. Our understanding of sexual orientation and gender identity has evolved for over 50 years as a result of scientific research, clinical observations, and study. Our position is that being gay, lesbian, bisexual, and or transgender is not a psychological disorder or mental illness. As such, it doesn't require treatment to change it. Furthermore, conversion therapy or attempts to change sexual orientation or gender identity are unlikely to work and are associated with harm and serious risks, including but not limited to suicide attempts and completions, depression, anxiety, and substance abuse. We understand that some people have more fluid sexual orientations or gender identities that may evolve naturally over time, but not as a result of willful manipulation or attempts to change. Senate File 23 does not prevent licensed mental health providers from talking with their clients about their sexual orientation or gender identity. It only requires that they practice according to acceptable standards of care. For those who may experience distress about their identities, that includes helping them explore their options, understand the stress of being part of a marginalized and stigmatized group, develop positive coping skills, nurture resilience, seek social support, and get accurate information about sexual orientation and gender identity. These approaches have been shown to be effective, evidence-based practices that are associated with positive outcomes in therapy. In conclusion, we support the passage of Senate File 23 to ban conversion therapy and attempts to change sexual orientation because they are unlikely to work, are harmful, and fail to meet acceptable standards of care. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Charmely. Uh, I'll call up Pastor Luca Joe Gropoli and Dr. Mike Lynn to the table. And Pastor Gropoli, you can go ahead and introduce yourself and begin your testimony. Good morning, Chairperson and committee members. Thank you so much for letting me uh, speak. Um, my name is Pastor Luca Joe Grappoli, and first of all, I'd like to begin to saying how devastating it is that it's being propagated that the church does not love the gay community. It couldn't be more wrong. That being said, this is about the law and not about love. As a pastor, the desire of my heart is to connect people to God. My goal is not to see gay people be straight, but it's connect all people to the heart of the Father. The outcome is his. Based on the author's previous testimony, I'm struggling to understand how this language will affect clergy. I am wondering if the bill author will clarify that. I was also, it was also stated that 81% of the people who received this counseling were religious leaders. I failed to understand the downside of giving anyone pastoral care. We hear that people have been raped, waterboarded, and electrocuted in counseling. And I have checked all of Minnesota and haven't found any records. So again, if this is the case, it would be helpful to provide documentation and evidence of this torturous behavior, which should already be outlawed in the law. To say that I am a fraud in my testimony or my book of how God converted me from a trans male to my original design negates the fact that I exist. I'm living proof that my claims about counseling are real and important and should, not be, and should be accessible to all Minnesotans. For you to state that these abuses occurred without proof is in and of itself fraudulent. The rule of law must be applied to all equally. 
most importantly, my constitutional protections are being violated. The government has no rights to regulate religious freedom by claiming to regulate counseling. This bill is breaking the supreme law of the land, the United States Constitution and the Minnesota Constitution. Know this, the church is here for those who are hurting, and we will continue to do what is good for the people in a kind and loving manner. Lastly, why aren't all the facts being presented? The American Psychological Association Handbook also states that 75% of or more of gender dysphoric boys and girls accept their cros 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 thank you crosmonal sex by adolescence or childhood. Why isn't that being presented? And why don't we have documentation of these allegations? I don't understand, and I wish that we had more proof of this. I oppose this bill. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pastor Grappoli. Dr. Lynn. Thank you, Chairman and committee members. My name is Dr. Mark Lynn. I'm a lifelong Minnesotan as well as a board-certified pediatric psychologist, and I provide care at Children's Minnesota through our gender health program. I am grateful to join you today on behalf of Children's Minnesota to express support for Senate File 23. My profession allows me to advocate for some of the most brilliant and the most vulnerable among us. At the junctures of time in which championing these bright, hopeful underdogs can very often mean the difference between life and death. I'm talking about our kids, kids, teens in Minnesota who deserve this space to grow and thrive and be, to live out and contribute to society by being their staggeringly beautiful, perfect as they are selves. Sometimes that brilliance, that beauty includes known normative, normative and healthy variations in human development. I'm talking about our gay kids, our queer kids, our trans and gender diverse kids, our kids who are still in the process of figuring themselves out. There are generations of gay kids, queer kids, gender diverse kids, whose magic and light have been seen as faulty, dangerous, or revolting. I was one of those kids. My faith communities were unwavering in their messaging that people like me were disgusting, shameful, and broken. I kept my head down and did not tell anyone of the magic within me, treating it instead, <clears throat> excuse me, like a malignant tumor that only worsened if others found out. Uh, but there was hope, I was told. Conversion therapy was available for those afflicted by same-sex attraction. So I enrolled myself in conversion therapy. It didn't work. And based on my experience and expertise as a psychologist, I can say that no kid should be subjected to that. Several years ago, uh, several years after, excuse me, I was outed. And that day I sat alone on the floor of my parents' basement thinking I was about to lose everything. My dad came home. Contrary to the teachings he had been exposed to, my dad came down to the basement and he got on the floor and just sat with me as I cried. He then told me, son, I don't understand this, but I'm committed to understanding this and I love you so much. My dad was an anomaly. His fierce love and his willingness to sit and stand with me are in large part why I can do what I am doing today. The science, the well-established facts are so clear. Conversion therapy has been denounced by every ma major medical and mental health association. And as long as youth are subjected to conversion therapy, the high risks for severe mental health outcomes, including suicide, will persist. I was one of the lucky ones. This year, Minnesota has the opportunity to ban the practice of conversion therapy with minors, removing this option from the table. So the survival of today's bright and beautiful queer kids can rest on more than luck. This year, Minnesota can send a clear message to kids and families here. You can expect that your state will be for you, guided by science that is backed up by lived experience. Thank you, Senator Dibble, for your leadership on this bill. Thank you, Dr. Lynn. Uh, we have one more Zoom testifier, Hunter Cantrell. Hello, uh, good morning, members of the committee. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Senator Dibble, for your leadership on this bill. Um, you inspire all of us. I'm former State Representative Hunter Cantrell, and uh, I'm here today to testify in strong support of this bill to ban the harmful fraudulent practice of LGBTQ plus conversion therapy once and for all in the state of Minnesota. This bill is the culmination of years of refinement to ensure that not one more child or vulnerable adult will suffer from the devastating practice of conversion therapy in our state, and that all Minnesotans are protected from charlatans who would seek to deceive patients and families into thinking that there is some cure for being gay or trans, or that such a cure is necessary. I am gay, 
and being gay, trans, non-binary, in fact, every other identity within our big, beautiful LGBTQ plus community is not something to be suppressed, but rather in the spirit of love and compassion, our shared human dignity uh, should be uplifted and protected. This is especially true within the dynamic of patient care. As healthcare practitioners, of whom I will uh, be, uh, as I'm a future physician myself, should be held to the highest standards of care given the trust that the public has placed in us uh, and should practice based not on bias or prejudice, but following the science and out of love and support for patients to live their full and authentic lives. Conversion therapy is being practiced throughout our state to this very day and at this very moment. Fundamentally, you as a legislature have a constitutional right and legal responsibility to regulate commerce and prohibit uh, deceitful, harmful promotion of goods and services to protect, to protect members of the public, especially children and vulnerable adults, from deceptive and demonstrably damaging actions that pose a threat to health and safety. Despite the rhetoric you have heard from some testifiers, there, there is no First Amendment protection to harm people, let alone children. Nor does the First Amendment preclude the state from regulating the unethical and dangerous conduct of health practitioners. In close, please vote yes in support of this bill so that future generations of children and their families can be permanently protected from LGBTQ plus conversion therapy in Minnesota. And that LGBTQ plus people from all, for, of all ages may know that they are perfect just the way we are. We do not need to be fixed and we deserve to be treated with dignity. Thank you so much, members of the committee. And thank you, Senator Dibble, for everything. Thank you, Mr. Cantrell. That was our last testifier. Uh, members, are there any uh, questions, amendments? Uh, Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Madam Chair. I actually have a, a couple questions. Um, and I don't know if, if maybe uh, Matt Burdick or, Scott, or Mr. Senator Dibble can a ask this, uh, answer this. When you, look at, um, when you look at Minnesota Statute 626-5572, Subdivision 21, <clears throat> you've now opened up the vulnerable adults statute. And I guess the question um, to you is, is when, when it's reported that a VA in Minnesota, you have to report that as a vulnerable adults reporting. Did you also um, connect that statute uh, along with your change in this bill? Senator Dibble. Um, thank you, um, Madam Chair, um, Senator Hoffman. Um, I, I don't know. Um, uh, I think, you know, the, the reason we included that reference was, was to pick up the, the definition of vulnerable adult um, because we, of course, you know, wanted to be sure to protect not just those who are, <clears throat> who are younger than 18, but, uh, but you know, anyone who, who um, may not have legal standing or, you know, personal agency. Um, in terms of reporting mechanisms, that may be just a little bit, beyond um, uh, maybe Mr. Burdick can help but um, or, or counsel can help um, uh, you know I, I'm not sure exactly what the mechanism would be should I'll, I'll uh, just, should a mental health practitioner be discovered to be you know under you know with license accepting remuneration for services providing conversion therapy when that's discovered um, what exactly happens by way of reporting how that mechanism works I'm not sure. I think um, MDH at Mr. Burdick or Christy. Christy, you have anything to add? Um, Madam Chair, members, Christy Graham with the Department of Human Services. So the, the bill is just referencing the Vulnerable Adults Act, so it's just kind of referencing the definition there. Um, and I don't believe that it's subjecting um, anyone to, re requiring anyone to report to the, uh, um, as a, you know, a, a violation of this, but the bill does allow the department to take back um, funding if this kind of practice is, is um, happening um, and build through Medicaid. So, Senator Hoffman. Madam Chair, thank you. So with that, you know, as a mandatory reporter under the Vulnerable, Alts, uh, Vulnerable Adults Act, um, I, I think, when's the, what, what's the next stop for this bill? Commerce. Commerce. So could you, uh, there needs to be a cross-reference between the VA reporting and, and this piece because if, if if the harm is happening, if somebody did violate that vulnerable adults piece, I, I would, I would strongly recommend that that also be because you're a mandatory reporter, right? You're mandatory on that. So, unless the department doesn't believe that that's necessary, my first thought on this is you've now invoked that VA statute. Therefore, it should be necessary to have some kind of um, redirection of that. If if this occurs, right, and we know it does occur, um, then 
you know, what are the next processes that need to be in place? Why put something out there? And I and thank you for putting vulnerable adults into this uh, piece, Senator Diller. I appreciate that. Though I would I would note um, prior to that is if there's some some clarification from the department, Madam Chair, or or better yet, if it, there's a redirection of that, so it does actually invoke the VA reporting piece. So, and then as a follow up, Madam Chair, and then um, it's Christy Graham, you can stay here for this one. D the DSM five. Um, there was a comment about reactive attachment disorder, and, and I, it's unsettling for me. Um, I know the DSM-5, if you look at the Mayo, uh, when it reports, there's no standard, there's no standard of therapy for rea reactive attachment disorder, but rather a whole processes of, of things that need to be. And there was a comment in one of the testifiers that said, um, this bill would have an adverse effect on reactive attachment disorder therapy. And, and I just, I'm having a, a conflict of, wait a minute, we, I know what the therapy exists. I mean, if you want to grab the DSM-5, folks, I'm not a doctor, but I played one in a play one time. But there, there's, um, there's actual step-by-steps on, on diagnosis, what are the affirming things that need to be. But clearly, when the Mayo says that there is no real standard of care, right, um, there are processes of care. So uh, I guess the, the question is, is do you feel that, that this is going to have an adverse effect on, on reattach, uh, the uh, reactive attachment disorder therapies that are currently out there, Madam Senator, Chair? Senator, who are you asking that question to? What's that? Who are you asking that question to? I'm asking that to either the, 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 the author of the bill because, or if, you know, somebody that could, could address, maybe there's a licensed psychologist in the room that could say, no, your your worries are are sidelined, but yes, they are sidelined. I mean, I just when, when you start proceed, to talk about forward, yeah. when you start to talk about those types of um, um, uh, disciplines in there, a good doctor is coming up. Thank you, Doctor Lane. Go ahead. I didn't follow that line of reasoning. Reactive attachment disorder is a multi-component. Um, you know. Uh, when I say treatment modality, it is very comprehensive. So I would say it's beyond treatment modality. There's nothing that would be contradicted in the care for reactive attachment disorder um, if there was uh, also intentional attention to not have conversion therapy. If you could get a little closer to the microphone, yeah. sorry. Yeah. So, Madam Chair, if I may. Yes, Senator. Um, I, I picked up on that testimony. I picked up uh, uh, in a thread of some other testimony as well, um, efforts to pathologize um, LGBTQ identity, sexual orientation, gender expression, and attach it to other kinds of issues that that folks struggle with. Struggle with as as if though there's a um, as a, as if those issues flow from uh, gender identity and and uh, sexual orientation, gender expression struggles, um, and and that's just simply not the case. People may um, suffer um, some consequences, but often um, we find that um, the issue, of course, is um, stigma stigmatization, if that's a word, um, uh, uh, you know, societal pressure, marginalization, um, et cetera. Um, and so um, if you look at the bill, um, it says uh, uh, counseling that provides acceptance, support, understanding of an individual, facilitates their coping, social support, et cetera. Um, uh, you know, people need counseling of, of all sorts. I've accessed counseling myself throughout my life. Um, uh, in an effort to find better clarity, better purpose, better connection around a range of issues. Um, my access and portal to greater stability, quality of life, mental health, is to, is to find a better understanding of who I fundamentally am. Thank you, Senator. If I could more Doctor? succinctly say, I was stumbling over my words because it is, it is tough to even wrap my head around the possibility that that would actually even um, have any role. Um, so I will say more succinctly, no, absolutely not. This has nothing to do with the treatment of reactive attachment disorder. I don't know where to start. I've written dissertation, so I could write a book on it. Um, and I think that's why I stumbled over my words a bit there. So, thanks. Thank you, Doctor. Madam Chair, just as a follow-up, I mean, the, awesome. the things that Senator Dibble and the doctor said, it, you know, one of the things to look for in react, reactive attachment disorder is safe and, safe and, and um, stable living conditions. It's a care planning team that puts in place. And so my first thought was, no, it's inconsistent with my current understanding. And you guys just validated that that is an inconsistent statement. So I appreciate that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator. Senator Abler. 
Thank you. I learn something every day that I'm here. I didn't even know there was something called that. Um, so uh, just have a couple questions and a few comments. And Madam Chair and Senator Dibble, we've discussed this. I, I missed your opening comments, and I would have liked to hear those, but it's been a decade at least, I think, this has been talked about. And I'm not going to be talk about much of anything that we've talked about then. But I just have a couple questions and then just a comment. And um, I remember a couple, two years ago, maybe in the hallway, there were some uh, young adults came and they were talking about this topic and they uh, were saying that there was waterboarding, electric shock, and I saw the list of the clinicians that they were saying did this and I went and asked them and they said, we haven't, we just don't do that. And, and so I don't think this bill has, I, you're not, your testimony wasn't that these are going on now, but it's the, it's the discussions and the counseling that you're worried about and there is no assertions that these other egregious things are going on anymore, even though they did go on, I was reading 50 years ago, but is that right, just to clarify. Senator um, Dibble. Uh, Madam Chair, um, yes, that is correct. Um, you know, certainly those sorts of physical pressure forms of, of you know, negative association, reparative therapy, um, it was called back uh, a number of years ago. I was going to circle back to that, as I promised. Um, reparative therapy, of course, implies that something needs to be repaired. What we're talking about now, of course, is reparative therapy by a kinder, gentler name. Um, but it takes the form of, of, you know, talk therapy, as people, people think that somehow that's harmless and benign. It's not, of course. It uh, causes tremendous, tremendous harm. Uh, to people on the order of of the kind of physical pressure that we talked to, that that was contemplated uh, in years past, but no, I don't think. Uh, for I mean, I, I can't say with certainty that that those kinds of aversive, um, negative association, physical pressure kinds of therapy uh, aren't occurring at all. But but that's not um, that's not what we find. In, Commonly. Senator Abler. Well, thanks, and it just, I just wanted to clarify that. I expected that answer, and so now people can at least focus on what the bill is talking about. And um, where my concern with this has been expressed um, simply in what people can say and what they can't say. And there's a trend going, even this year, about teachers, what they have to say in a classroom, what they have to be taught. Uh, through rules and not even through our legislative process and now what a psychologist can't say and um, that's where I get that and I think that a better way is to help um, any counselor understand what you're trying to get across is that it's not benign, it may not be what they thought they were happening and it, in the professional sense they're allowed to um, you know, work with their client in a way that's respectful and thoughtful and yeah, I don't think you can ever think of all the things that you wish they wouldn't tell somebody or ways they wouldn't go about it. Um, but my issue is just the, the, the free speech thing. And, but I, I do have one more question. Senator Abler. Um, thank you. Um, and so uh, there were two, I, I'm sorry I was late, there were at least two pastors came up uh, and they were just, I, I presume I know what the answer is, but I just want you to, I was going to counsel you that I was going to ask this question, but I didn't get it, didn't run into you soon enough. Um, so I presume that the one pastor who wants to present at a conference somewhere uh, about his experiences, um, and they offer him an honorarium to address a group, or um, that that would be allowed under this bill. Is that right? Senator Dibble. Thank you. Uh, yes, Senator Abler. Uh, and thank you for asking the question, um, because I was going to circle back and, and make those points, so you're helping me. Um, so a couple of, of points to make in response uh, to your question in response to a previous testimony. Um, as I said in my opening statements, which was brilliant, I'm sorry you missed it, I'll send you the link to the video. Um, uh, this does not reach into uh, expression of religious freedom or anything that a pastor can uh, say to their congregant. Um, and it doesn't uh, inhibit, someone talked about a book, someone could write a book and sell a book. Uh, someone can give a speech. Um, this is about representing whether or not uh, uh, in, in the effort to sell conversion therapy services. Um, you know, this is, an, you know, as, as uh, you know, parents are often misled uh, and, and are fearful, um, um, uh, representing that, that uh, in, a, in a licensed clinical setting in, a, in, a, in, in exchange for remuneration, in exchange for pay, um, that 
uh, conversion therapy, the ability to change someone's sexual orientation, sexual identity, gender expression um, is effective and free from harm. That, that's what the bill speaks to. Madam Chair. Senator Abler. Uh, my last question, and um, somewhat related to this, the second pastor who came, at least the one, the second one that I saw, the, who talked about her own uh, personal counseling that she would be doing with people and her own experiences. And so if she wanted to one-on-one uh, -on -one meet with people at her church or talk to a group of people at her church um, under the auspice of a faith thing, then there's nothing in this bill that limits her uh, for doing that um, even though she may be salaried by the church that she's working at and talking to people. Is that right? Senator Dibble. That is correct, Senator Abler. Thank you very much. That's all I have, Madam Chair. Senator Utke. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yes, this bill is uh, extremely broad as we've uh, been discussing all the different things that could come in, into it. And I do have some questions because uh, uh, I am concerned about government getting into private speech uh, between a counselor and a client. Um, this is a, an intimate relationship that's protected under law, um, and it leads to a point where, you know, it's, it's basically a non-constitutional censorship of, of free speech. And we've, you know, heard some different things throughout, but um, just for clarity, does this ban what we've heard from uh, the testifiers, and I've seen uh, in other places, um, even talk therapy. Senator is that what this is? Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, Senator Utke. Um, uh, the short answer is yes. Uh, you know, if someone is um, receiving um, services from a licensed practitioner, um, that is, of course, cognitive talk therapy, um, and you know. The use of the word talk therapy is somehow um, harmless or benign is a mistaken notion. Um, what is being communicated to that individual is um, somehow uh, who they are, what they're seeking, um, can be A, changed, and B, um, is, is somehow not the norm, is not the normal state of being. Um, being LGBTQ is normal. It's healthy. It's natural. It's, uh, it's, it's how people are, and uh, uh, efforts to counsel people out of that orientation um, uh, isn't benign. Um, it's A, ineffective, and B, is harmful, as shown by uh, the evidence that we've heard today. Senator Rucky. Thank you, Madam Chair, um, and thank you. Um, a little different angle. Could a client voluntarily seek counseling? I mean, we, we, we kind of hear about maybe these people are uh, persuaded or taking in or, you know, somebody else is directing this for them. But if that client w wanted to pursue this strictly on their own, would they be able to do that? Or would, you know, our professionals are regulated by boards, but now we see this going after them too. Would that voluntary... Um, counseling be available. Senator Dibble, and if you could speak a little closer to the sure. microphone, too. Thank you. Um, uh, Senator Aki, certainly if someone is 18 or older. Okay. Senator Aki. Thank you. So, it, it, as this bill says, that a minor just has zero options because uh, even if they were um, wanting to do this, which I guess eliminated my follow-up in a way, which is still another concerning part, is we're also going after the elimination of the funding. Um, but that's, I guess, that one has to follow the other. Um, we've, we've heard testimony today, too, about uh, this language um, in other states, and it didn't stand up to the test of the courts. Um, the language in this bill as it's written, do you see that this could stand up to that legal challenge? Um, or is it going to be something that uh, is just going to employ a, a number of attorneys in the way it goes? But, uh, you know, I, I'm concerned about that is uh, everything we do has to stand up to the rule of law that's currently there in the courts. Where do you see this one? Senator Dibble. 
Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you for the question, Senator Utke. Um, in fact, uh, this language has stood up um, to many, many court challenges. There's one um, uh, narrow uh, ruling on one grounds in, in, one, di in one jurisdiction that's um, it widely accepted by uh, many legal analysts as to be an error and, and an extreme outlier. So the short answer to your question is this, is this has stood up to many court challenges across the country. Uh, one court has found differently. Um, that is, of course, under review, and, and that decision likely won't stand. Senator Yep, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, going into Section 3 of the bill, um, in actually Paragraph B, um, when we, in the first sentence there, no person or ent entity shall, while conducting any trade or commerce, and that any jumped out at me, um, as you look at, and then this would lead to um, possible civil action against the professionals. I mean, any, that's, that's wide, wide open. Where do you see this landing? Um, how do we tighten that up to, I mean, how would they even know what to go with when it just says any? It's, it's wide open. Senator Dibble. Well, I think uh, you need to read the rest of the paragraph. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Rucke. Um I would, uh, I would uh, draw um, members' attention to lines uh, 2.18 through 21. Um, uh, it's about advertising or otherwise offering conversion therapy services and banning the representation that they are um, effective um, and also representing homosexuality as a mental disease, disorder, or illness or, uh, you know, like I said earlier, guaranteeing that someone's sexual orientation or gender identity um, can be changed. So this is um, about making sure that there aren't false and deceptive trade practices as folks are offering uh, conversion therapy services who are licensed um, uh, uh, clinical practitioners. Senator Rucky. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. And I was just going over, I had had a lot of questions, but they've been, a lot of them have been um, either covered or we've talked on them. Um, you know, I'll just go back as I wrap up. It's just the fact that um, we're regulating free speech, the, the speech between uh, the professional and the client. And I, I think this is going down a dangerous path. Um, I don't think it's something that could stand up in the court of law. Um, the, the First Amendment is, is extremely important and extremely strong. So I would just hope that that comes into conversations as it moves forward. So thank you. Thank you, Senator. And I would like to just kind of bring us back to the bill. It's not talking about free speech, right? The bill is saying that we cannot practice things that aren't evidence-based and that have no basis in real medicine. We cannot do these things to children. That's what the bill is saying. If I told you that there is zero evidence that a colonoscopy prevents cancer, and then I told you to go get a colonoscopy. Would you go get a colonoscopy? Probably not, right? And then if I told you that a third, almost a third of people want to kill themselves after getting a colonoscopy, would you go get a colonoscopy? So that's what this bill is doing, right? It's taking something that's not real medicine and saying we cannot do this to our children. Senator Liskey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Senator Dibble, I do have one question for you. Um, it is pretty straightforward. We just passed a bill off the Senate floor that told us to trust children in the decisions that they make for their own health care, and now you are telling me that we don't trust children to make decisions for their own health care. Now, I agree that conversion therapy, as you just described, Senator Mann, um, that it is an issue. We're not presenting it as a good thing. I don't think that was what I'm trying to say. But if a patient under the age of 18 seeks uh, mental health care and wants to discuss these subjects with their provider, it should be open to trusting those individuals for those discussions. Um, and so that's, I think, what we're trying to get at with the free speech or the, the, the discussion about speech. Um, so Senator Dibble, uh, can you explain why we trust patients under the age of 18 for one decision, but now we're not trusting them for this decision. Uh, I just will briefly add that uh, they can do that, right? They can go into any counselor's office and discuss sexuality. That's different than going in for conversion therapy. 
Senator Dibble. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, thank you for the question, Senator Liskey. It's an important question, and it, and it uh, seemingly represents a paradox, so it needs to be responded to, so I appreciate your asking the question. Um, conversion therapy um, is a harmful, discredited practice. Um, more often than not, I would say almost in every case, um, young people who find themselves uh, in conversion therapy clinical settings um, have been sent there by their parents. So it's a, it, and it's and it's about um, subjecting them to a particular practice that has a designed outcome, which is to persuade them that they are not who they are fundamentally as the human being that they are. To persuade them that what they are is fundamentally wrong, uh, and disordered, uh, and has been pathologized. It's a very different discussion about having personal autonomy, agency, self-determination, uh, bodily autonomy, um, and accessing uh, a, a positive set of services on their own behalf um, as they try to move towards greater health. Conversion therapy has dire consequences in young people's lives, and they've been forced in almost every instance into those situations and those settings because they don't have legal standing and they don't have personal agency. So that's the distinction. So I thank you for the question. Senator Liskey. Thank you, Senator Dibble. Thank you, Madam Chair. Again, like I said, it's, it's not that I am wanting to fight for things that are forced, coerced. Uh, like you referred to, parents generally send their children there under the guise of purpose. It's, we heard some testimony today that some people chose this on their own. Uh, they chose to have these discussions with their therapists in private settings. That's the stuff that I'm curious if that is protected or not protected based on, on this situation. So that's all I wanted to bring up. Thank you. Senator Morrison. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator Dibble, for your long <laughs> fight to get this banned in Minnesota. Um, We've heard a lot of uh, things today. I want to thank the testifiers. And I really just want to speak directly to LGBTQ Minnesotans, um, my family, my friends, my colleagues, and especially to LGBTQ youth. Um, I, it's traumatic and harmful to have your very essence debated in public like this. And I just want to recognize that. And I just want to say that you are seen and you are loved and you bring wonderful diversity to our state, um, and I hope that this is the year that we finally ban this abhorrent therapy. Thank you. Senator Utke. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, your comment to Senator uh, Liske uh, kind of brought me back to a question I'd asked earlier and was told no, but uh, and it was, can a client voluntarily seek counseling to receive licensed professional help? Um, just on the topic, it's not going in for conversion therapy, but if they've got questions, and I was told no, is that still the, the same answer, uh, Senator Dibble? Senator Dibble. Um, thank you, um, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, Senator Utke. I'll, I'll just bring you back to the, to the bill. Um, conversion therapy means any practice by a mental health practitioner or mental health professional. I think we clean that, those references up that seeks to change an individual's sexual orientation or gender identity, including efforts to change behaviors or gender expression or to eliminate or reduce sexual or romantic attractions or feelings toward individuals of the same gender. Conversion therapy does not include counseling that provides assistance to an individual undergoing gender transition or counseling that provides acceptance, support, and understanding of an individual or facilitates an individual's coping, social support, and identity exploration or development including sexual orientation, neutral interventions to prevent or address, or address unlawful conduct or unsafe sexual practices as long as the counseling does not seek to change an individual's sexual orientation or gender identity. So the answer to your question is absolutely yes. A young person can seek counseling to explore issues and questions of a wide variety, including issues around gender identity, sexual orientation. Conversion therapy is a specific thing. It's geared towards persuading that person that they can and should change their sexual orientation and their sexual identity. That is an impossibility, A, and B, it creates tremendous harm in their lives. 
Senator Arkey. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you. That just adds added clarity because I wanted to separate the two, so thank you. Perfect. I'm um, seeing no one else on the list to speak. Senator uh, Dibble, do you have any closing comments? Uh, Madam Chair, uh, I just want to close by um, thanking everyone who um, stepped forward to testify, to tell their own stories, the courage that that takes. Members, I hope you appreciate um, to step forward and to expose yourself with that level of vulnerability and that level of honesty um, to reveal that kind of pain in, in someone's life um, is a great honor uh, in this public setting, in this great forum, and I hope you understand uh, how, how in incredibly privileged you are and how privileged we are that people come forward to speak on behalf of themselves and on behalf of generations of people who didn't have this opportunity. So thank you to everyone, as well as thank you to everyone who has been working so hard for decades to bring us to this point. Um, and then finally, Madam Chair, um, I won't go through them all as going to, but it would take too long. But there are probably two dozen um, uh, professional uh, medical uh, and, and uh, other kinds of professional organizations um, that speak out strongly from the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. We've heard from the Academy of Pediatrics, Association for Marriage and Family Therapy, College of Physicians, the AMA, and on and on it goes, um, recognizing um, that this is a discredited uh, practice that should not stand up. And Madam, I just, Madam Chair, I just want to say that um, some would argue that we should just leave this to the professional licensing boards. Um, well, in Wisconsin, um, that was the attempt. Um, and. Uh, an activist extremist legislature has moved against those licensing boards um, to allow for any sort of professional standards of sanction um, when this sort of discredited harmful practice is being carried out in clinical settings. So policy in this realm is very, very important. In an era, we are talking about freedom of speech and freedom of thought and freedom of ideas. In literally dozens of states, books are being banned from school and public libraries. Uh, in states uh, across this country, um, whether, whether teachers can reach out in an affirmative way to LGBTQ young people is being banned outright. And curricula are being banned. People are being erased aggressively. We have legislation in this legislature that would seek to marginalize and criminalize LGBTQ people in their forms of expression. So young people are hearing us. They're seeing this. And they're suffering the consequences of what's happening in our society. It's very real and very present. Um, and conversion therapy is just one of the ugliest manifestations of this effort to move against LGBTQ people as human beings um, who are beautiful in every way possible. We need the gifts that my community brings to these tables and to every realm and every endeavor and every sector in Minnesota life. And this is a bill that would help us protect that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator. Senator Bolden, would you like to make a motion? Yes, Madam Chair. I move that Senate File 23, as amended, be recommended to pass and be re-referred to the Committee on Commerce and Consumer Protection. Thank you. Um, on the motion, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, no? No. The motion prevails. Uh, congratulations, Senator. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Next up, we have a presentation from NDH. Assistant Commissioner Dan Huff, please proceed. Can proceed when you're ready. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Dan Huff. I'm the Assistant Commissioner for Health Protection with the Minnesota Department of Health. I am joined today by my colleague, Dr. Stephanie Adele, 
uh, Dr. Yandel is a supervisor in our uh, lead surveillance uh, unit. Um, I wanted to provide an overview of lead uh, and its health impacts um, in Minnesota. <clears throat> First of all, um, some of the things that uh, are important to remember is that children are at most risk for uh, the toxicity of lead, and that's because they're smaller body mass, but also because they are growing and developing. Because of how lead impacts the body, it uh, uh, can interfere with brain development, interfere with development of various organs. And so uh, the younger the child, uh, the more vulnerable they are to lead toxicity. And there is no safe level of lead. Lead is a toxic substance, and there it is... Uh, uh, has a negative impact on the body at whatever level. It is just that the higher the level, the more severe the impact. And that lead impacts brain development, and thus it impacts learning and behavioral development. Uh, lead impacts all people, uh, regardless of age, because it is toxic to the human body. Um, as I said, it impacts children and then um, uh, developing children the most, so women who are pregnant and young children are highest at risk. And it has uh, a fun it, it interferes with bodily functions throughout the whole body. Um, the one we talk about most is the mental impacts or the impacts on the brain, but it also impacts the kidneys and other uh, various organs. Um, <clears throat> So the, uh, there is no threshold for when lead begins to decrease IQ. What we do know is that uh, lead actually, by impacting brain development, will actually decrease the IQ of children. The higher the level of lead, the more that impact is, is evident. And we know that children throughout Minnesota are impacted by lead. Uh, we have, uh, um, if you look at this uh, map here, green is sort of the average of how much children are impacted by lead. You have a few areas that are yellow, and that's where you actually have um, children lead levels are lower than the average. And then as you get to that aqua blue or dark blue, that's where children are, uh, have higher levels of lead than the state average. But it's important to know that even children in the yellow areas do have lead, it's just at a lower level than the average Minnesotan child. And uh, again, in looking at uh, kind of zooming in in the metro area, we see some of our older neighborhoods, so we often see housing that was built um, uh, before 1978 when, when lead, paint was, lead paint was banned in residential settings. Um, we see older housing, but also we can see that this has an equity impact. Um, lead impacts disparately uh, children from lower income settings who have, uh, may live in older housing stock and who have um, uh, lower family income to be able to address lead-based health home hazards. Uh, so how do we know where lead occurs in the state and where children are being uh, have elevated blood lead. Uh, when a child goes to their uh, well care visit, either with their family physician or their pediatrician, um, they are often will have a, a lead um, test taken. So it's usually a capillary test. So that's where the finger prick and that little capillary tube, that is then tested in the clinic for lead. And if lead is present uh, or present at a high level, then a venous draw is taken, and that uh, uh, venous blood is sent to a lab for additional analysis. Um, and if that comes back uh, elevated above 5 micrograms per deciliter, it's well, all results are reported to the Department of Health. But when it's above 5, we take action. We have some local public health organizations like City of Minneapolis, uh, Ramsey County, Hennepin County, who will do their own evaluation and investigation. For those other areas, MDH does the investigation. We follow up with that family, we meet with the family, and we evaluate what possible lead hazards 
or causes of that lead poisoning are in their home or in their environment. We look at lead paint-based hazards. Uh, we do dust swipes of window sills um, because often it is older paint is in window sashes and it's that friction that creates dust. It doesn't have to be just eating lead chips. It's the actual dust that gets spread around. We know that toddlers are often very uh, you know, hand to mouth. They're picking up things, they're exploring their environment, they're on the floor, and that lead dust can get on the floor and then they put it in their mouth. Uh, same with soil samples, lead can be in soil. Um, and then we also look at uh, other types of, of uh, things that might be sources of lead in the home. Um, and here is what we have found, the major sources of lead in Minnesota children. Uh, first, it's the deterioration of lead-based paint that's in the home. And then we also have found, though, that spices, uh, pottery, food products, uh, sometimes candy from, uh, that's been imported, um, medic some traditional medications, some cosmetics, especially those that have been imported, um, we have found uh, sources that to be a source of lead. Also, jewelry, keys. Um, you know, when you think of uh, uh, especially cosmetic jewelry, it's often heavy. You know, gold and silver are heavy metals, so we want to kind of mimic that. Well, lead is often used in cosmetic jewelry to make it feel heavy, like gold. Um, keys, uh, uh, things that we often think are safe for kids to chew on, may actually contain lead. Uh, toys, uh, when I, I previously worked in the city of Minneapolis, when my kids were toddlers, I picked up some you know, toys at the, at the uh, thrift store, and I had them tested, and I'm really glad because my kid would chew on the toys those contain lead, um, and never would have suspected that. Um, and then we also know that sometimes there's take-home lead, um, either from a parent's occupation or maybe a hobby where they're exposed to lead and may bring home lead dust on their clothing, on their shoes, on their lunchbox, um, and uh, that is another source of lead. Well, um, you'll see that I didn't mention water as one of the top sources of lead poisoning. But what I think is important to know is that water creates a lead burden in all of Minnesotans, depending on the plumbing system. And I want to show these two tables here. Now, it's important to note that the y-axis is a little different here, so you can't compare the size of the bar between the two different charts. But if we look here, that dark blue is the amount of lead that is a uh, attributed to waterborne lead coming through the plumbing. And if you'll look at our very youngest children, zero to six months, they have a disproportionate lead burden from water. And now that is also when children are the most sensitive to lead toxicity. So there is a concern about lead in water. <clears throat> and if we think about where is this coming from, uh, it is almost always in the plumbing system. And we have done a very good job uh, from a municipal level of uh, taking out the mains that were anything that might have had lead. And also there were fewer of those built because lead pipes usually did not exceed two inches in diameter just because of the properties of lead. It's so heavy. Um, but we do have a lot of premise plumbing that is in people's homes and the lead service lines that connect their home to the, the central municipal system. Those were often made with lead, depending on the age of the house. It's often very difficult to know if you have lead-based plumbing. Um, I checked my plumbing. It was galvanized. Um, I assumed that I was fine. Um, as I said, I have two children. They're, they're both now adults. Um, but we've lived in this house for many years. Just last year, we replaced our service line from the city main to my house. The plumber told me the first 10 feet of our line that was underground was lead. Quite concerning for me as a parent and someone who works in the public health profession. Um, 
unknowing, even though I'm very concerned about protecting my children from lead, we were drinking water from a lead pipe for 20 years. Um, we also know that in uh, the solder, uh, especially solder that was uh, produced before uh, 1995 and 1986, um, had higher contents of lead, and then our fixtures, so actually faucets, will have lead in them. Um, depending on how old that faucet is, they may have a higher level of lead. Um, and so uh, um, this slide just sort of re-emphasizes re, uh, uh, that this is also true for the service lines that go to schools um, and to daycares. Um, and uh, as a result, the governor in his budget has proposed, as you will remember in uh, Commissioner Cunningham's presentation to you, um, a number of funding proposal that will help the department in removing lead and addressing the issues of lead in our service lines. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, happy to answer any questions. Thank you, uh, Assistant Commissioner Huff. Uh, any questions? Senator Rucky. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, question for you is, this is a, um, a huge drop. We're going from, what, 10 to uh, 3.5. Um, you know, we, we see a lot of things, and uh, one of the things I had uh, known before and had commented here at the table was for kids in particular, um, a lot of this stuff that's imported. You know, you mentioned um, the toys. We see jewelry. We see even in some cases food products. Those are a little easier to tackle, um, but where do you see this going? I, I know we've got a fiscal note, and it shows costs to basically implement this change, but I'll call it the unintended consequences, but that isn't really the right term. But w what is this going to lead to as far as, you know, we did a, I think the last slide even talked about schools and uh, – you know, we've got old buildings that are functional under the current uh, requirements. Moving the needle this far, do we have any idea what that fiscal cost would be across the state um, for older buildings and such? And, you know, I think they are all working over time to correct these things because they're falling within specs at this point, but we're going to push possibly some of them out of compliance. Do you have a feeling on that or any, uh, have you done any work or any uh, pen, putting pen to paper to see what that might be? Um, Senator Uckey, this is just the presentation on lead. The bill is coming up next, but if you have any comments on that, that would be fine. If not, we can go to the bill. Um, Madam Chair, um, I'm happy to uh, uh, just make a couple of comments. Um, uh, the statute language that you mentioned, um, Senator Uckey, uh, does mention at 10 micrograms per deciliter. It also allows for the Commissioner of Health to, thank you. Um, the, uh, the bill does say state at 10 micrograms per deciliter. However, the, uh, the language in the current statute does allow for the Commissioner of Health to uh, change that level based upon any public health need. Um, the commissioner did make that determination, and we now investigate all children at a level of five or above micrograms per deciliter. I think it's important to know that this is the action level for public health intervention. This is the action level upon which public health agencies investigate the lead poisoning and determine the sources of that, work with the family to address those sources, and protect the child. Thank you, Madam Chair. I didn't realize I was jumping the gun. We went through the presentation. I thought that's what we were heading to. So I will, uh, yeah, we just kind of <laughs> segued into no it, but worries. I'll uh, wait till we get the rest of it. Senator Abler. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. And I just, uh, you know, that is bad. Uh, and I just, I don't know, sometimes you just can't help yourself, Mr. Madam Chair, as you engage with the department on other topics. And during, um, Mr. Huff and I had a discussion about the dangers of karaoke uh, during COVID and tried to rescue that, but um, tried to get screening and all that. And 
We were unable to come to terms with that, but I'm glad we can agree. I just had to work that in somehow, Mr. Huff. Um, but I, I'm glad we can be on the lead thing. It is truly important, and so uh, this is a, a real risk. Thanks. All right, seeing no other questions. Oh, one more question, Senator Hoffman. How can you not, I mean, it, this is, so Mr. Huff, you, every time I listen to you, it's like I, I learned something that I didn't know like before, and, and not to mention the karaoke thing. I don't know what that's about, but um, there are a whole bunch of, uh, and maybe this is something to segue, it's a great segue that Senator Ecke going into as Senator Morrison's bill comes up to be consistent with what, you know, the guidelines are, but there's a whole bunch of communities out there that have these lead, I mean, lead pipes that, you know, or, or allowed the state at one time allowed some communities to do, to go below what the, the standard was set. I mean, how are you doing trying to impact um, those problems that exist out there? I mean, it's just, it's almost overwhelming just to hear this. And, and I know families and that uh, were affected by uh, their children, young, young, young children, lead poisoning, and now have lifelong um, neuro chronic. They, they live with a chronic disability because of that. And so, I don't know. What, uh, is there going to be any ask for bonding or something to try to help? Fix Assistant some Commissioner, of these other cities, Mr. Huff. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, uh, Senator Hoffman. Um, in the governor's budget, there are, uh, we do have a request, one, to conduct a, or to provide grants for water systems, mostly cities and towns, um, to uh, do a lead service line inventory so that they can determine where is lead within their system. Uh, and then we do have funding to help uh, education institutions and child care to remediate lead hazards within their facilities. Um, this is a company's uh, several um, large uh, amounts of money from the federal government as part of the recent infrastructure bills um, and the uh, Inflation Reduction Act. Um, so we believe that they're part of the governor's budget as well as matching with the federal budget additional funds for water systems to both identify and remove lead and for child care and uh, schools to be able to uh, do the same. All right, well, we do want to wrap up by 1030. So with that, I will thank you, uh, thank the Department of Health, and we will move on to uh, Senate File 162. Thank you. Senator Morrison, please present your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair and members, thank you for the opportunity to present Senate File 162, which is a very simple bill and is critically important in light of the presentation you just heard. It just modifies the definition of elevated blood level from 10 micrograms to 3.5 micrograms of lead per de deciliter of whole blood. Current statute sets it at 10 micrograms per deciliter. In 2014, our health commission determined that five micrograms per deciliter was an appropriate measure. The CDC has set 3.5 micrograms per deciliter as an elevated blood level of lead for children who are most vulnerable to lead poisoning. By adjusting the definition of an elevated blood level, the state and local health departments will be able to catch more children who have elevated blood lead levels and provide remediation services to more kids and families who are experiencing the adverse effects of lead exposure. Um, and as we learned from today's presentation, there are three things to remember about lead. Children are most at risk, no level of lead is safe, and lead impacts learning and behavior. So let's align with CDC, decrease the cutoff, and protect more kids. Uh, I do have one testifier, I believe, on Zoom, Madam Chair, Dr. Zeke McKinney. Thank you, Senator. Um, Dr. Zeke McKinney, introduce yourself and proceed with your testimony, please. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Zeke McKinney. I'm an occupational and environmental medicine physician with Health Partners, uh, an affiliate assistant professor at the University of Minnesota School of Public Health and a researcher with Health Partners Institute. Uh, my clinical focus is on environmental toxicology. 
So, with regard to uh, this lead issue, I think uh, Mr. Huff and Senator Morrison did an amazing job, but I'll try to cover the bases. You know, really, the purpose of public health interventions are to protect those who are the most vulnerable. Regarding lead exposure, as mentioned, fetuses, infants, and children are the most vulnerable populations because of the ongoing development of various organ systems. We know as humans, lead has been known to be a hazardous exposure for about 4,000 years. And again, no safe uh, blood lead level has been identified for children. We know children can be exposed to lead in their home through paint or their pipes, in their community, from air and soil and water, from their family, through, for example, uh, people working around lead, bringing it home, from various consumer products or even from eating meat from hunting. Of course, younger children are the most at risk uh, because of these developmental issues and also putting their hands in their mouth and not being uh, discriminating what they're putting in there. This is really an issue of environmental justice and health equity because lead exposure varies in different populations, particularly by race, ethnicity, and socioeconomic status where people from underrepresented race and ethnicities or from lower income families are more likely to live in settings where there's a greater chance of lead exposure, whether because of older housing, environmental contamination, et cetera. Uh, lead is most concerning because of the effects on the brain and the nervous system, most of which can be permanent, even at low levels, whether it's slowed growth and development, learning behavior issues, hearing and speech issues. And these tend to lead to lower intelligence, issues with focus and concentration, worse performance in school, consequent poor educational attainment and professional success. And of course, at high levels of exposure, lead can lead to seizures and coma and death. Uh, lead can also increase risk of long-term problems with the cardiovascular system, with the kidneys, with the gastrointestinal tract, with the reproductive system. Uh, you know, if we see children experiencing symptoms, that certainly means an elevated blood lead level. However, most of the time, children have elevated lead levels without any symptoms. And so it's uh, really established that lead can have adverse health health effects at every organ system in the body. And so even though lead can be excreted over time from the blood, if exposure is stopped, uh, it actually gets stored in bones and then takes decades to decrease and get excreted from the bones, during which time some of that lead will then be circulated in the blood and more of these health effects will be caused. So this change to 3.5 was proposed by the CDC in 2020, or actually was changed in 2021 by the CDC uh, to represent the 97 and a half percentile of uh, highest exposure in the country, meaning that 2.5% of children in America will have levels above this uh, rate, uh, this level of 3.5 micrograms per deciliter. And so by reducing what's been, or by, sorry, uh, reducing what's considered an elevated blood lead level in Minnesota, this allows for required reporting at lower levels than previously, intervening on ongoing lead exposure for more children at earlier points in time, increasing the availability and screening uh, in medical services in the most at-risk populations, and improving data for planning further public health interventions regarding lead exposures. So ultimately, we can more effectively identify the children and communities most at risk for ongoing lead exposure. So again, there's no safe lead level in children. And so if we wait until we know about the exposure, the damage is already being done. So really, prevention is truly the best cure. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair and the rest of the committee. Thank you, Dr. McKinney. Uh, members, any questions for the testifier or for the author of the bill? Senator Rucky. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, for our testifier question, and uh, I, I like what I see in the background for, from someone who can play nothing at all when it comes to music. It looks like uh, you could <laughs> do a concert for us, and that would probably be pretty good. But uh, where do we see for the people that you see that are coming in with high levels of lead, where does most of it come from? Is there some, or is it a, a, a broad variety of things, or are we able to kind of hone in on where some of the real problems are? Dr. McKinney. Uh, yes, thank you, Senator. Uh, really, it does vary quite a bit. I mean, to be honest, in my environmental exposure clinic where I'm more seeing adults or adults uh, with concerns around reproductive issues, I see people with retained lead bullet fragments, for example, though I don't think that's the most common source. Uh, amongst my colleagues who take care of children more frequently, uh, it does seem to be a variety of sources, including, you know, the lead water pipes, including some of the consumer products of which there are a variety of them, whether it's uh, manufactured here in the United States or elsewhere, uh, as well as contamination of soil that we've seen even from leaded gasoline, you know, spanning back to before it was banned in the 70s and 80s. So uh, there's really a variety of sources, and I don't think we can pinpoint only one, but as we start to continue to reduce this level of or what's considered an elevated blood lead level, we're going to more and more effectively identify the populations who are most at risk. And to be honest, the fact that we've continued to reduce this level uh, since establishing it uh, first at 12, 10 uh, micrograms per deciliter in 2012 shows that we've been successful at continuing to reduce the population uh, burden of lead. Senator Rocky. 
Other questions? Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Is that a Jazz Master and a Taylor bass behind you? Uh, no, no, it's just a simple Marshall one. Honestly, these are all pretty basic, and I would say I'm a basement DJ at, at worst or best. All right, got it. I just was trying to, I was looking whether either that's a Fender acoustic bass or a, or a Taylor made acoustic bass, and I was, since Senator Utke had to bring that up. And so, um, again, wealth of information, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Anything else? Okay, seeing no other questions, uh, Senate File 162 is laid over for possible inclusion in the HHS omnibus. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Did you have any closing comments by any chance? <laughs> thank you for your attention, committee, and thank you, Madam Chair. All right, very good. Um, so tomorrow we have a couple bills uh, that we're going to go through, take a look at those. Otherwise, there is no more business before us today, so we are adjourned.